Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. So uh, this is our second in this uh, kind of question and answer webinars. Uh, we have um, Sam Asravadam, uh, Siva Mulpuru, Amar Kilu, and uh, uh, Christy Simone, uh, just to work here as panelists to try to answer any questions that you have. Our point of focus for today's session is AVNRT, but with as any in the series, feel free to ask any questions that you have uh, outside of this, especially if there's been a particular problem, a case, something you'd like to discuss. If when you would like to ask this question, feel free to use the question answer uh, a format or come on chat and just post your question. If you'd like to come up here as a panelist and present your case, just let us know when you put the question and we'll bring you up and discuss it. Last time we didn't have time to go over everybody's uh, answer and we uh, reached back to, to you. Uh, today, whatever questions we don't get to we will record answers and post it along with the YouTube of the session as well. So we'll do our best to get everybody's uh, questions answered. We uh, also uh, would encourage you to send in any cases, slides, or questions that you have that you feel should be addressed in a little more detail that you'd like to present to us. You can send it to cvwebinars, all one word, at mayo.edu, or email it to any one of us here. All our emails are available in uh, the slide uh, to you. So uh, maybe just to get things uh, started and spur some discussion, I'll spend about uh, five to 10 minutes kind of hitting some high points about AV node reentry that over the years have been the most common questions that come up when we have a referred case or a, a trainee asks a question, or we ran into someone in the pre-pandemic days at a meeting and a question came up. It'll usually be about what there's very little known about the anatomy and circuit of AVNRT. When things don't quite work right, some variants like AVNRT with AV block, for example. Very often in the last few years, it's been how to approach AVNRT in congenital heart disease. Folks have figured out in practice that the CS plays a role, either anatomically or just as part of the circuit, and when we have to involve the left atrium. I won't cover all of these, but I'll introduce a few things about anatomy. And based on what you feel is the most relevant question, I'll uh, switch and we can come up. Do the other doctors on this panel will also jump in to comment. Uh, any of the Mayo faculty who are listening into the session, fe please feel free to jump in. Let us know if you'd like to cover some of these as well. So just a couple of things, you know, uh, as a trainee, one of the most uh, perplexing things about this arrhythmia is the simultaneous activation of the atrium and the ventricle. And while the early days it was thought that was because the origin of the arrhythmia was in the node and could go to the atrium or the ventricle, what we know now is AVNRT is largely an atrial circuit that happens to have its turnaround point in some part of the AV node. And from that turnaround point, we're able to reach the ventricle and atrium at about the same time. How does this come to be? You know, the fixity of the conduction system, when we think about sinus node, his bundle and AV node, the sinus node is fairly fixed external surface and that angle between the SVC and right atrial appendage. The His bundle is fixed, 
membranous septum, kind of shared space between the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve. The part that has to be kind of approximated is the AV node. And this is fundamental to understanding how to avoid problems with AV and RT ablation. And we approximate that in this border zone between the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, roof of the coronary sinus, and the tendon of Todaro, which for all intents and purposes can be visualized as the eustachian ridge, just extending, extending up to the membranous septum where the His bundle will be uh, available, will be recorded. And another way to think about it mentally, the where the AV node is located, is to think about it in a perpendicular plane, like a four-chamber plane cutting through fossa ovalis, the AV node site septal leaflet, and that would look something like this. And here we see the structure that we cut through is posterior and lower than the membranous septum where the His bundle is located, but in this atrioventricular septum, right atrium on one side, left ventricle on the other side. And this region in this view is where we would visualize this compact AV node. Note that this site is atrial to the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So it's an atrial structure on the right side, but across it's ventricular to the mitral valve leaflet. So from the left, when we visualize the same region, it's a ventricular structure. On the right, it's an atrial structure. Autopsy studies in patients who've had prior slow pathway or in the early days, fast pathway ablation, the site of the lesion is in the triangle of Koch where the AV node is located, except lower, lower than the level of the roof of the coronary sinus, whereas the fast pathway lesion site is not in the triangle of Koch, but behind the tendon of Todaro. Very important kind of learning experience from that to explain to us the anatomic difference between this slow and this fast pathway site. So if we think about that, the AV node region versus the slow pathway region. We think about the AV node being atrial to the septal leaflet, but we're visualizing it close to the annulus and above the level of the roof of the coronary sinus. On the other hand, the fast pathway itself, because it is behind the tendon of Todaro, on the left anterior oblique view, we see that fast pathway site being leftward. Anything in front of the eustachian ridge and tendon of Todaro is forced relatively rightward because of the structure, but we pull the catheter back, we wind up being left of that site. Why that's important to understand that the fast pathway is a distinct site compared to the His bundle is when we have some variance of AVNRT. So here, for example, we have a situation where a well-placed CS catheter shows eccentric activation, and yet we have VA timing being exactly at the same time. The part to try to visualize, and this is a very, very frequent question in a difficult case, is the circuit of AVNRT that's outside the triangle of Coke. So we know the slow pathway came into the AV node and then we exited through the fast pathway in typical AV and RT. But what happens to complete the circuit? And there we're really left to the vagaries of the atrium, many possible ways to complete the circuit. It's possible to climb right back across the eustachian ridge, but when that's not possible, because this is a line of block and the crystal terminalis is acting as a line of block, those are the cases where we use the left atrium to complete the circuit. And that could be just along the septum. It could also be around the posterior wall, which is typically devoid of much myocardium or some fused pattern. 
And once we get to the left atrium to make it back to the AV node, we're using the muscle of the CS to get us back to the slow pathway region and up to the AV node. And this is the reason why even though we're dealing with typical AV node reentry with earliest site at the fast pathway, the CS may show varied activation patterns. And the way we would sort this out is compare the timing with the true fast pathway site, the lower behind and leftward pointing in the LAO view compared to whatever appears to be early in the slow pathway location. I would say once a year, once every other year, would have a case that would be presented or referred by saying what looked like an accessory pathway when it was ablated, we found AVNRT. And the reason for that is because of this unusual or eccentric activation. So I'll just stop there. That was just to get everybody's thoughts started and uh, would be great to see what questions you have or thoughts you'd like to share. Uh, feel free to uh, put in your questions either in our question and answer or in, uh, uh, or in the chat box from everybody else. So I'm seeing a, uh, seeing a uh, question about uh, timing of activation and type of AV node reentry. So, and please do let us know if you'd like to come up here and discuss the uh, uh, question specifically. Maybe I'll take a quick shot at this uh, answer and then I'll ask uh, perhaps uh, 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 Dr. Kilu to maybe uh, complete this with uh, any slides that he has. I also see a question about is AVNRT a micro reentrant atrial tachycardia? Uh, and uh, again, if you would like to come up here and present your thoughts on that, please let me know and I'll move you over. So let me take a quick shot at both these questions first. So first is the question about timing. So in other words, we've got the AV node, we've got the His bundle, we've got an input to the AV node, we've got an output from the AV node during this tachycardia. And regardless of what type of AV and RT it is, from wherever that timing turnaround point in the circuit is, if we're going towards the ventricle and we're going back to activate the atrium, there's really no true VA conduction in AVNRT. There's no true HA conduction in AVNRT. It is a pseudo interval. It's just a race between this turnaround point to when we reach the His and the V to when we reach the A. And because this is a race, depending on conduction characteristics, how proximal the, the turnaround point in the AV node is, depending on how much decremental tissue remains to be crossed, it's possible to get a complete continuum of VA and HA intervals in any type of AVNRT. So in other words, in slow, slow AVNRT, it's possible to have simultaneous V and A activation. In slow, fast AVNRT, it's possible to have a long RP. In that case, it would be the fast pathway exits very early and takes longer to finish going through the remaining AV node and getting to the His and the V. Uh, and just a quick thing, I believe the question was, why don't we consider AVNRT as a re-entrant? I think the question was micro re-entrant AVNRT, uh, atrial tachycardia. And where that question is coming from is all of this is atrial activation. All of this is atrial activation. So why isn't it a, a, a re-entrant atrial tachycardia? And in fact, you could consider AVNRT as a re-entrant atrial tachycardia that just happens to use 
a portion of the AV node for the circuit. But unlike any other atrial tachycardia, the slow zone for this tachycardia is specifically AV nodal tissue. And that's why we distinguish this and call it AVNRT. Why not, why not micro reentrant? The reason is the remainder of the circuit does not have to be micro reentrant. It could be a very large circuit. Some types of AVNRT in some patients, we can entrain with concealed entrainment, the AVNRT from the left atrium, two to three centimeters away from the location of the AV node. So I, I, I hope that uh, answers uh, your, 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 your question. Anything that you'd like to add, Amar or Siva? So I, uh, I, I, I see another uh, question. Uh, and uh, uh, the, if, uh, if you'd like to come up and present these as well, please do. Uh, but uh, one question is, what should we consider when we haven't performed, uh, we haven't successfully ablated AVNRT with a very large CS. Specific question is about uh, a persistent left superior vena cava. And maybe I'll just uh, start with that uh, uh, to explain what the issues are in terms of just purely getting the appropriate contact when we have a very large CS. So if we look here, we, we, get, we get the problems when we have, here is our coronary sinus, here is the roof of the CS, here's the location of the compact AV node. So the issues that can come up is one, if we have a very prominent eustachian ridge, then when we put a catheter on the ridge and try to torque the catheter towards the slope pathway, and in fact, this is the same issue when you have trouble with AV nodal ablation, is this acts as a fulcrum and can move the catheter away from the septum. So it just becomes very hard to maintain contact on the low septum. High septum is no problem because we're above the level of the eustachian ridge. It can be very easy to get a his location, but then you're having struggles with trying to maintain appropriate contact for uh, ablating the slow pathway. Two issues that happen when the CS is much larger. So one is the larger the CS, the more disparity between the floor and roof of the CS. So in other words, if we're used to keeping a catheter, say from below, that is hugging the roof of the CS, and we fail to recognize that the CS itself is very large, then what happens is we ablate at the level of the roof and in comparison to someone else's roof, which is going to be clearly below the level of the compact AV node, you might underestimate how close you are to the compact AV node, and that could result in inadvertent ablation of the AV node. Now, the larger the CS, the more likely that we will have a prominent region between the eustachian ridge and the septum. These are the same patients who may have prominent pouches, who may have very prominent eustachian ridges. So making it doubly difficult to try to get contact onto the uh, AV node, the slow pathway to the AV node uh, ablation site. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. AP would like to come in as a panelist. And uh, what is the question that uh, Dr. AP has? So the question is, he saw a patient today, a uh, 45-year-old female with uh, tachycardia and uh, incessant tachycardia. And this is the ECG he wanted to uh, show. We also have some questions about what are the lower and upper common pathways. 
maybe uh, Chris, if you want to be prepared to discuss that while we look at this ECG. So do you want to start discussing the ECG, um, Abhishek? Yes. Whenever somebody has incessant tachycardia and narrow complex tachycardia, we are you know, obviously worried about the usual three differential diagnosis, AVNRT, AVRT, and uh, uh, junctional tachycardia. Yeah. But this is a very uh, interesting ECG, which... Uh, show, show us the ECG while you're yes. discussing it. So okay. this is a narrow complex tachycardia. And uh, first step would be to identify if we can see any P waves or retrograde P waves. Ideal leads would be to look at the inferior leads where you can potentially... see some of these P waves. If you can see what dots I made and even here. So it seems like a narrow complex tachycardia and the differential again based on this could be some form of AVNRT, AVRT or uh, atrial tachycardia, potentially even junctional tachycardia. Yes, so, so, so Abhishek, I think the history I just saw uh, Dr. AP had put in here mm -hmm. is 45-year-old palpitations throughout her life mm -hmm. got worse. I think here, uh, generally, you, uh, if you're having paroxysmal palpitations all your life, you know it's not going to be permanent palpitations throughout their life because there's going to be cardiomyopathy but paroxysmal palpitations that then become persistent. You know, paroxysmal palpitations that then become persistent. You know, the things I, we think about, and maybe I'll just draw a quick picture here to explain that um, situation. So, and I'll also ask uh, Dr. Cannon shortly to comment because we run, run into this more commonly in the younger patient group. So one scenario is a patient has a somewhat decremental retrograde accessory pathway and has normal AV nodal conduction. So the patient is able to get tachycardia, manages okay, once in a while gets symptoms, does okay with a beta blocker. When they get older, AV node conduction gets worse and the pathway characteristics may also slow. They'll sl relatively slow conduction. So now what was a paroxysmal tachycardia gets induced even with sinus arrhythmia, any old PV PAC, and becomes incessant. So that's one that we, we definitely think about. Another, uh, uh, another one that, uh, you know, when you have one is to one conduction, narrow complex, shortish, AV node, uh, AV uh, uh, conduction times, VA conduction times, is AVNRT that has more than one slow pathway. So what happens here probably is they have, say, typical slow fast AVNRT, paroxysmal, rapid, comes and goes, comes and goes. But then over time, Either they're slowing in the AV node, slowing in the fast pathway, or they develop a second form of AV and RT that may have enough of the AV node as part of its circuit that allows it to become sustained. Now, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia becoming persistent is very rare in the usual areas. Crista terminalis tachycardia, typically the syndrome stays the same. Uh, non-coronary sinus of Valsalva, the syndrome, if it started paroxysmal, stays the same. Pulmonary vein tachycardia as an atrial tachycardia. When it starts, it stays the same or transitions to atrial fibrillation over time. The exception to this may be appendage tachycardias. So appendage tachycardias in the young uh, tend, to, tend to start off uh, being uh, uh, paroxysmal, and then over time, they tend to uh, become a persistent type of tachycardia. Often with what's happening is uh, uh, the appendage itself 
getting larger over this time. So uh, Brian, uh, would you like to comment for us about just in the younger age group, when you have a shortish RP tachycardia that's incessant, any thoughts that come to mind? Sure. <clears throat> you know, in, in young people, the AV node conduction tends to be a lot faster. And as they get older, sometimes you'll see slowing of conduction. And like you said, that may make something more paroxysmal. But usually whenever we're seeing tachycardias that are becoming more persistent, I found it to be AV node reentry tachycardia, which develops in the teenage years and the typical course is it becomes more frequent or the episodes last longer. And a lot of times people actually ignore short episodes of symptoms just because they think that they're palpitations. So when they start having it more frequently, maybe when they present to attention, but uh, junctional tachycardia outside of the newborn period and postoperatively is relatively rare. So you always have to kind of think about it because if you don't think about it, you'll miss it. But you also have to realize that that's a pretty rare differential diagnosis. Another thing is if you have atrial tachycardias that are coming very close to the AV node, that will appear to be a short RP tachycardia just because it's so incredibly close to the AV node. So I think you have to think about all these things as you move forward. Thank, thanks, a lot. thanks a lot, Brian. Chris, would you like to take an early shot? And I see several other questions uh, coming up. Uh, if any of, the, any of the folks, any Mayo faculty would like to answer, that's great. Chris, there's a question about uh, upper common, lower common pathways. And uh, some folks are asking, where are they? Others are asking, is, it, do, are, is this even real? Would you like to make a comment? And I'd be happy to share some pictures as well. Sure. I'm trying to bring up this one amazing picture you have <clears throat> to kind of try to get that. It's kind of the title says AV dissociation, AV and RT. So really, uh, yeah. you know, I've heard of these things, this upper common pathway and this lower common pathway. But to me, I don't know so much if I'd characterize them as a pathway, but I always think of it as somewhat as having some tissue that's outside of the AV and RT circuit. Upper common is between that and somewhere in the atrial tissue. L lower common pathway being somewhere between the circuit and the hiss. But again, I don't know and, and you'll have much better insight about what you want to call this pathway per se, or if it's just tissue. I've clearly seen in the lab AVNRT, and you'll see this uh, lower common pathway block, and then you keep watching it, and then all of a sudden it goes one-to-one. -one. I've seen that plenty of times, I but I just I, don't know I, if I'm con con convinced about an actual pathway. Well, let's let's. Uh, I think this is what you were alluding to, Chris. Yeah. So if we if we look, these are the cases that we wind up asking the question about common pathways. So, you know, sometimes you see this. So you have atrial activation, which is twice as frequent as ventricular activation, and yet at other times the same sequence the same timing when there is a V and an A, you can prove beyond doubt it is AV and RT, and you succeed by ablating the slow pathway input to the AV node. So how does this happen? The second, which is a lot harder to explain, is exact same scenario. If you take beats where there's equal V and A, and when the tachycardia has equal V and A, it's AV and RT but sometimes more V than A. So this has brought in this kind of question about you know, common pathway. So first of all, when we think about common parts of the circuit with AV and RT, the AV, distal AV node, his bundle are always common parts of the circuit. In other words, you can have the circuit keep going on even if we didn't have those structures. So here's what I mean by that uh, in uh, a diagrammatic form. So if we have here AV node, we have one input to the AV node, we have a turnaround and we come out. So if we think between the circuit and the ventricle, all of this is a common limb. It's all distal to the turnaround point of the tachycardia. But what we mean specifically when we say common pathway 
is even before we reach any part of the AV node, we have one input and we have the output that then reaches the AV node through like a common stock. So if this were to block, for example, the tachycardia would continue and you'd have no discernible relationship or necessary relationship with AV nodal activation. So point of decrement can vary to the His bundle or to the ventricle. So this would be what the construct at least of like a lower common pathway. So these patients sometimes in the early days before this entity was thought of would be, I had a case of typical AVNRT or atypical AVNRT. And then after ablation, patient comes up with an atrial tachycardia and guess what? I wound up ablating it very similar to how we ablate the slow pathway. Now, this of course does not explain how you can get more V than A. And for that, we'll have to kind of uh, go back to the figure that uh, we had looked at in uh, terms of the circuit of AVNRT. So here, if this is where we have the compact AV node, we have the inputs to the AV node here, say slow pathway, say left side slow pathway, any input to the AV node, an output behind the tendon of Todaro. If that output wasn't behind the tendon of Todaro and rather could complete the circuit in this region itself, then the way you are getting to the rest of the heart is through the usual exit of the fast pathway, but that exit itself is not essential for the tachycardia circuit. So if we were to get block at that site, the tachycardia can continue, go down the his and to the V, but doesn't get to this uh, rest of the atrium. So how do we know if such things actually uh, exist? I mean, one of the questioners asked, is this even real? Part of it is it's just difficult to come up with any kind of explanation for those phenomena. The other is just uh, pacing maneuvers that try to pick up for us, you know, how much, how much of this circuit could be potentially outside of the AV conduction system axis. And if we use that kind of construct, then comparing the time it takes from when you record the His to the A anyway, anywhere, when we pace the ventricle versus tachycardia, how much difference would exist between these two intervals gives us an idea of how early is the turnaround back to the atrium. And if the difference is huge, that turnaround is very proximal, making you think that it turned back to the atrium even before you reach the AV node. In other words, there is some kind of common stock or common pathway that's uh, uh, part of this uh, par part of the circuit. Now, there's a question uh, I see about um, from Dr. Mao about what are the signs during early RF energy that could be harmful and that we're not actually targeting the slow pathway. And I see also another question about what is the potential uh, downsides or harm with empiric, I think what the, it's meant is empiric slow pathway ablation. So uh, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Kilu to just give us a construct of uh, what you use to monitor ablation when you're doing a, uh, a sort of classic slow pathway site ablation. 
So um, with slow pathway ablation, obviously the, one of the concerns with AVNRT is we want to avoid AV block, right? So uh, the approach I think is important. Uh, I favor using a CS from the neck. Uh, that's the change in practice that, that I had early on in my career. Um, part of the reason is, is twofold. One is stability and two, it hugs the floor of the CS. And with the ablation catheter, when I'm doing the slow pathway, I like to get that underneath the CS catheter. And I find that that actually provides some protection in case the catheter slips and it saves it from going superior right into the AV node hispondyl region. The other thing, uh, once I'm doing the slow pathway is I usually start very low and, and I go slow. So the approach I take is I'll use a lower power and I'll gradually up titrate it and I'll be watching for any prolongation in the AH interval. So I actually will set the calipers on the AH, make sure I have a very stable reference. And I'm having the nurse in the room, the fellow, all of us basically looking at that while we're ablating, making sure we're stable, making sure it's not getting uh, longer. And then gradually up titrate the power incrementally. So for example, I may start at 15 or 20 watts, depending on the catheter I'm using, and then go up very gradually up to the target. So, so, so Amar, you've yeah. told us like the approach for catheter stability, but in terms of when will you know in terms of like the junctionals that you are seeing or not seeing? So I think the question that a couple of people have had is, A, if you don't see junctionals at all, are you, can you still be successful with ablating the slow pathway? And what are the early clues that we're running into trouble that we might be having uh, potential for AV block? Yeah. So, so, yeah. Oh, no. So, uh, yes, you, to answer your first question, yes, you can be successful without seeing junctionals. Um, you know, and if you do a very low line, you may not see any junctionals, but I've certainly had cases where we've eliminated AVNRT by doing that. And uh, I favor a linear line from the uh, leaflet, tricuspid leaflet back to the uh, anterior lip of the CS. But yes, you can be successful without necessarily seeing junctionals. So I guess one way, I guess I could use this picture to demonstrate this. If we have the AV node as a septal structure, and then we've got the inputs to the AV node, as it approaches the AV node, we're getting narrower and narrower, kind of, I sometimes like to picture it as like two hands making a handshake. The AV node puts its hand out through an inferior extension. The atrium is tunneling all together, putting its hand to kind of meet at some point. The atrium is much bigger than where this connection to the AV node is. So it's essentially like a fan and if we're very close, we're going to be close enough to the AV node where we'll see automaticity and the junctionals and not many ablation lesions to transect that slow pathway. If we're further away, we're not gonna be able to heat up automatic tissue to ca cause these junctional beats. But if we are in a protected area where we can transect all of the atrial fibers that are going to reach that slow pathway input, we could still be successful. Now, uh, the other aspect of that uh, do uh, doctor's question was, what can we harm other than the AV node? And maybe I'll take a quick stab at this and then we'll, if you see any other questions you'd like to answer, uh, any of you, please let me know. But if we are thinking about where can we ablate, so one thing is definitely AV nodal damage. The other is if we're ablating proximate to the coronary sinus, we might inadvertently get into the CS and it's possible you could fall into a middle cardiac vein. And if that happens, you could have coronary injury. This is much more common when we're doing posterior accessory pathways, we worry about it. But if we're not watching that catheter, that is a possibility. Another is the story of a patient where it's hard to induce AVNRT, 
You don't know if you have good endpoints. Patient is extremely symptomatic to begin with, not too much documented tachycardia. So these times we might over ablate in this posterior region. We're over ablating because we don't have good endpoints. We're staying posterior because we're not even sure we want to do this and we want to stay far away from the AV node. In that case, we must remember one of the occupants of this pyramidal space, the outside part of the heart here is the autonomic uh, nervous system, part of the fat pad and ganglia in this region. And if they are over ablated, we can have higher sinus node rates. So these patients could develop if they didn't already have a syndrome like uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Now, uh, 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 any of you have seen any other question that we'd like to look at? If Dr. not, Singh. Uh, yes, Dr. yes, yes, Siva. Dr. Singh has a question on you know how to approach slow pathway ablation when the patient has two to one, two, one for two response during the diagnostic part of the procedure. Fantastic, fantastic question. Uh, do you want to take a shot at that, Siva, or should I go through it? I can start and maybe you can Great. add on. So sure. first of all, during AVNRT procedures, you know, we try not to ablate during tachycardia. It's very difficult to, um, to separate junctional beats compared to tachycardia when the patient is going fast. So if the diagnosis is confirmed to, to be AV node reentry, try to do the ablation when the patient is in sinus rhythm. So where you can observe for these slow junctional beats with one-to-one -one response to the atrium. Yeah, so this is, I think this is just a great question and it's very, very common uh, issue. And I'll just generically kind of, uh, try to answer. So one is when you have this weird types of AV and RT, not weird because the slow pathway is in some unusual location, but the physiology behavior of the AV and RT is unusual. How do we monitor? So one of the issues is if you have more A than V or more V than A, then our classic maneuvers to diagnose AVNRT are not helpful. Our classic maneuver to diagnose AVNRT is you put in a PVC and only by advancing the retrograde his, you're able to advance the retrograde A without a change in activation sequence and reset the tachycardia. But you can't do that when the numbers of A's and B's have no good relationship with each other. So the simplest and most practical way to answer this question is just sit tight and wait. Nobody always has VA dissociation or interval changes during AV and RT. You will see with some change in autonomic tone, putting in a PVC, putting in a PAC, where they'll have one-to-one -one conduction. And when they have one-to-one -one conduction, you can make the diagnosis on familiar grounds. Your usual ways to establish the diagnosis will still be operative. But if there is a case where it stays with more A than B, for example, then we can still define this arrhythmia as AVNRT by using the construct that whatever it is, the circuit of AVNRT, the inputs to the AV node near the AV node are necessary for this tachycardia. The even when we have more V than A, the A in front of the tendon of Todaro close to the AV node are still required for this tachycardia. It is a tachycardia that uses some, but not necessarily all atrial myocardium. So it is possible to entrain the tachycardia from uh, this site to show that 
We have atrium really close to the AV node that necessary for the tachycardia. The rest of the atrium is not essential. The AV node and his are part of the uh, are there for every beat of this tachycardia. So then we put that all together and say it's AV and RT. Now, in real life, though, you'll always see that you'll have some two for one in all of these variants. You'll see some one to one conduction. Now, the other part of that question was if you start out with weird VA relationships at baseline, how do you monitor the slow pathway ablation? So, in other words, Dr. Singh is giving us a scenario where at baseline, there is no VA conduction. We know that even if there's no VA conduction, there's no HA conduction at baseline, you can still get AV and RT because the place where the V to A, the pathway that's being taken is not entirely shared by the turnaround site from AV and RT. So all of us have observed this at some time or the other. The problem is when we're monitoring for slow pathway ablation, the junctionals that are seen may not show a retrograde A. Now, this is usually something that gives us a minor heart attack when we see a junctional without A. But yet the junctionals without A may be exactly what we'll see in patients like this when they have adequate good site slow pathway ablation. So good way to try to address this is be ready to pace the A. So what we're really interested in is anti-grade conduction. Is it getting destroyed or not? So we have someone with their thumb ready to pace the A just a little faster than the junctional rhythm that's being seen without an A. And if the anti-grade conduction is intact, we can continue to ablate. An even more difficult scenario is when we're ablating in the vicinity of the coronary sinus. In some patients, the pyramidal space is very deep. The ganglia is right opposite a traditional slow pathway ablation site. And when we ablate, we get a prominent response like a vagal response that gives you even complete AV block. Now you need a lot of courage to continue doing that ablation in that situation. So what to do in that circumstance? Because here, even if you paste the A, you're going to get AV block. You will see this as AV block. Now in such cases, it's good to just regroup, look at your fluoroscopy, see where the catheter position is, look and see when the patient got their AV block, if the sinus rate also showed did the sinus rate also slow? And if the sinus rate also slowed, suspect a vagal mechanism. And once you've got all the anatomy in line, you can either pre-treat with atropine or glycopyrrolate if the patient is on an LMA or a ventilator to reduce this vagal tone. And then you can continue with the ablation uh, the same way. Uh, I hope that uh, answers Dr. Uh, uh, Singh's question. Any others that any of you have seen that you feel we should uh, address uh, in this last 10 minutes? And we will definitely get to all the other questions uh, in a separate session that will be part of this uh, uh, YouTube link when we uh, go through this as uh, go through this as well. Sam, one question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I can't hear you well, uh, Siva. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay. So one theme that uh, a lot of people are asking. Are oh, it's it's difficult to hear you, Siva. Maybe I will just go to Amar for this one. Uh, so I was just going to say, in some circumstances, uh, when you're ablating in the slow pathway, you can get prominent junctionals that then keep reinducing tachycardia. And that's, I think, an interesting scenario. It can be challenging because you don't want, at least I, I don't like doing ablation during AVNRT in the slow pathway. And so there are some patients where as soon as you come on and you're low down, you know you're safe, but the junctional beat then starts triggering AVNRT. So I think yeah, it's, that's, you, 
That's a fantastic uh, point, Amar. So, uh, you know, you just kind of brought in two issues uh, together, and that is ablating during AVNRT. And the second is junctionals in the role of inducing AVNRT, uh, including during ablation. So, you know, just a couple of things I think it's useful, especially for uh, trainees in the audience. One is because the eustachian ridge naturally guards the um, septum. You know, job of the eustachian ridge in fetal life is to direct stuff to the PFO rather than towards the ventricle. It's never easy to get good contact on this region. And because we struggle with good contact in this region, if their heart is beating at 180 beats a minute, it's that much harder. And while we get pretty good at making sure we don't ride high enough, even when contact is not good, we just won't get a good ablation. And what do we wind up doing? We wind up torquing the catheter for contact. And when you torque the catheter on the eustachian ridge, two things will happen. The catheter will move towards the septum, the tip, it will also ride up because it's a diagonal ridge. So when it rides up, you're going to maximize your contact exactly where we don't want to maximize contact. So we really try to avoid uh, ablating during AVNRT. Now, on the other hand, uh, if we have a situation where junctionals are inducing AVNRT, in fact, in some ways, when we think about it, junctionals are the best way to induce AVNRT because from the junction, you have absolutely coming out through the exit, the fast pathway. The slow pathway may be completely in unoccupied or recovered because your origin was close to the slow pathway and you can start AVNRT. Unlike a PAC that has to tease out the differences between refractoriness of the fast and the slow pathway, junctionals are a good way to start tachycardia. And in fact, a good little trick is trouble inducing. You can very gently, catheter-induced junctional beats may be a way to start AVNRT in some patients. Gentle, because you don't want to bump the fast pathway, making it super hard to proceed with the case in those patients. But your point that you brought up is while you're ablating the slow pathway, you're getting junctionals that are now, it's off to the races. So one little uh, tip that I like to share when that's happening is stay away from automaticity, but still stay close to the slow pathway. So go for a lower line. The lower line may give you PACs, like from the CS myocardium, for example, but you're less likely to get junctionals and may or may not have been able to complete the circuit. But now, if you go back to your usual site where you try to ablate, the tachycardia itself may be no longer inducible or much harder to induce so you're, while completing the slow pathway line, you're actually doing like a perfect EP study by inducing your junctionals. And now you see you don't have that problem anymore. So it's kind of downshifting to a lower line, but because you're not used to doing the lower line and you want to be sure, after that you come back to the, say, mid-CS level where you're used to doing that line. Does that seem fair, Amar? Yeah, it does. Uh, the only other thing I, I think some people like to do is use cryo in that situation as well. I don't know your thoughts on that because less likely to get junctionals. And I, I think it, it's a valid approach. It's a fantastic idea. And uh, in fact, our pediatric colleagues or when we do pediatric cases, it's we prefer that. It's often uh, said that cryo gives us better contact that's true, but it doesn't give you contact necessarily where you want to have the contact. In other words, the same eustachian ridge that's making it tough to get there will make it tough to get there for any catheter. Uh, 
But once we're there, we're there. And because the junctionals are far less common, you won't have this issue coming up. The other way is occasionally the best way to get contact is to come from above. And here, you remember that the natural way to go, the catheter goes, is tough to go into the fossa ovalis behind the eustachian ridge. Maybe Abhishek can share some examples of where he's tried to do transeptals from above, of how difficult it is to get contact in that site, but naturally gets you this angle catheter with the eustachian ridge in this angle to get you contact on that site. So cryo, doing this double line, getting to that location uh, from above may all be ways to, uh, to try to solve this problem. I see some other fantastic questions about, you know, the left inferior extension and then um, uh, should you come off when you have fast junctional beats? Since we're out of time, what we'll do is our panelists will answer these questions and we'll put it as an addendum to the discussion place for uh, when we post this recording on, on YouTube. Um, anything you'd like to add, Russell? And thanks a lot for your help with putting this, uh, put this, putting this all together. And, no, I, think, uh, I think we're good. Great, great. Thank you everyone for, for joining us. I think there were three uh, very nice, but questions we could not answer uh, during the live session we'll try to address now. Uh, uh, one is the left slow pathway. Uh, there were a couple of questions. One is about its existence and where is it? When do you ablate? How do you know where it is? Another outstanding question was about in atypical AVNRT, in other words, retrograde slow pathway, do we ablate anatomically or do we map the earliest site for uh, the A and ablate at that site? And another very nice question about the slow pathway potential. What is it and can we use this to guide ablation in cases where there's unusual physiology or unusual anatomy? So Abhishek, if you'd like to start on this slow path, left side slow pathway, and I'll uh, find us some uh, slides that we can potentially use as an adjunct to uh, to your discussion as well. Right. So certainly the left-sided slow pathways uh, it becomes an important uh, entity when we start to look at tachycardia and the retrograde activation is earliest in somewhere in the coronary sinus and not on the fast pathway location. So at least we know based on that, that the retrograde limb is the uh, slow pathway, left-sided inferior extension. Generally, they exist about two to four centimeter into the CS on the roof of the coronary sinus. So when you get into the coronary sinus, not immediately at the roof at, of the coronary sinus, very proximally, you will also could ablate the AV node. So you don't want to ablate there. But as you advance the catheter in more in about two to four centimeter in and confirm it on the LAO view that you are more distal here, you, those would be the targets where those would be the A location where you would potentially ablate the left sided slow pathway or the left inferior extension, what we uh, call. Then there's okay. another in, inferior left sided extension, which is even further in that is extremely rare, and that also can be uh, ablated from the coronary sinus. There was another question whether to ablate it through the coronary sinus or to do a transeptal and ablate it. I think both approaches are reasonable. I think you know sometimes if you are unable to ablate from the coronary sinus or if you feel that the local electrogram is not changing or the impedance is starting to get too high in this location, then certainly a transeptal approach can be performed so that you can target the same area, um, uh, 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 same location from the left atrium. But the key thing is that you have to ablate two to four centimeter inside the CS and not ablate very, very proximally because there's going to be a very high risk 
of ablating the AV node and complete heart block if you ablate too proximally. Great, and maybe I'll add to that uh, here, Abhishek. Um, I'll share my screen now. And uh, if we go to So in a way I like to tell myself about left slow pathway ablation. First of all, you know, numerically there's so many different variants of inputs to the AV node, but outside of our usual slow pathway, this left inferior extension is the most common because anatomically the AV node, the extensions are the right inferior, left inferior and right in the middle separating these two incision, these two extensions is the artery to the AV node. So the artery to the AV node sort of is what's causing the symmetrical inferior extensions on both sides. Now, like you stated, how to ablate this, we know AV node is above the lev level of the roof of the CS. We also, the AV node is a septal structure. These output from the AV node, whether it's fast pathway or slow pathway, cannot be too far from the septum. So that's, I think, like one of the key things to try to keep in mind. If we see eccentric activation in the CS in what otherwise looks like AV and RT, it's probably retrograde fast pathway. And we're just getting to the CS through one of these left atrial CS myocardial connections, and we don't even have to ablate them. We actually can ablate the usual slow pathway. The second thing is in the variant you spoke about, where there's a left inferior extension being used as the anti-grade limb and the usual fast pathway as the output limb. It's slow, fast AVNRT, but the left slow pathway is the input limb. So here, if we ablate the usual right inferior extension, we're not going to eliminate the tachycardia. And because it's the anti-grade limb, we cannot map the earliest site as was asked in the other question, because that's not the output limb, that's not the retrograde limb. So in that case, anatomically to ablate, we remind ourselves this is like a symmetrical issue with where we're ablating the right inferior extension. But we have this hole, the CS, that takes us to this spot when we look at that symmetry. So how to ablate there? Well, we could say I want to be close to the roof of the CS, but as you pointed out, the osteal roof is the floor of the AV node. So yes, you can ablate in the roof, but you have to be sure we're not in the osteum, as you stressed but it may not be several centimeters. In most cases, it's not. It's just inside the CS, but it's on the roof and we just make sure we're not at the osteum. Now, that site, we could get better contact sometimes with transeptal to target that site. We could ablate in the CS at this site. And when we have these cases, they're usually redo cases, they're difficult. So many operators would choose to do both in that circumstance as well. Now we also have another unusual situation where the anti-grade limb to, is through the left inferior extension, but the atrium and the extension are secluded or long enough that the protected zone of that tachycardia may be significantly displaced from the septum. Not to say that you cannot ablate closer to the septum, but if you were trying to entrain the tachycardia, you might find perfect entrainment quite a distance from that site as well. So in that circumstances, the skill of being able to entrain the tachycardia may give you multiple options to where you could ablate this, but it's technically always easier to ablate close to the septum, just like we do on the septum with traditional slow pathway ablation, because there's just less of a fan. 
you're closer to a narrower, the isthmus portion of the tachycardia to try to ablate. So just some points to kind of add on uh, to uh, to what you what you mentioned. Now we also had this uh, question that came up about um, the slow pathway potential, and also about can you map and ablate atypical AVNRT? So uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll ask Amar. Do you have any any uh, comments about like mapping atypical AVNRT to figure out where you'd like to ablate? Sure. So um, it's helpful to um, do obviously maneuvers to determine that. Sometimes using PACs from various regions to try and determine um, what. Uh, limb the circuit is using is helpful. So the, the... so Amar, if I were to push back a little bit, no. so do, uh, so I fully agree with you. You're taking the kind of purest EP view uh, for thing that we will identify the anti-grade and retrograde limbs. But I think what the doctor was kind of saying is a, a one where we may have a shortcut. That is the specifically mentioning atypical AVNRT. So in other words, the output is not the fast pathway, mm -hmm. but the output is one or the other slow pathway. Right. It's probably not uh, the output of only one slow pathway because if I'm assuming there was just like a regular ablation in the right slow pathway done, but let's say no ablation is done. Mm -hmm. Now, if we say the output is the slow pathway, however weird that slow pathway may be, that is the output to the atrium. Mm -hmm. So if we were to map the earliest A, that would define for us where that slow pathway is exiting to the atrium. And then we know where the AV node is located. So we could consider using that as a landmark to ablate to get to the site. So we're not really putting in PACs to figure out what the anti-grade limb is, which is the only way we can do it if this unusual slow pathway was the anti-grade limb. Mm -hmm. But by our usual definition, we're saying atypical AVNRT, what was mentioned in the question, then the slow pathway is the retrograde limb. So then can we just map it and ablate? And you'd have to say that, you know, it's probably the most common approach, isn't it? We, if we have a retrograde slow pathway, the two most common approaches in practice are anatomically ablate the pathway we know to ablate and hope it's gone, or we map the retrograde early A to tell us which slow pathway is operative. We knew it was retrograde slow pathway because retrograde fast pathway was late in this tachycardia. So what is early, then we could map and ablate in that site. Is that fair, do you think? That's fair, yeah. You could do that for sure. Yeah. Now, what about this slow pathway uh, potential? Maybe we'll spend four or five minutes to kind of uh, discuss uh, what we feel is utility in that slow pathway. So question, I think it was two people, but this thing about can you map and ablate the slow pathway based on the slow pathway uh, potential? Maybe just because of uh, time, let me take a quick, quick shot at this to kind of uh, uh, to discuss it. If we think about this idea of why is the potential where we ablate slow pathway complex? And why is there so much controversy about the slow pathway potential? So how did this come to be? So natural question in the 90s or mid 90s was, let me look at all my cases where I got successful junctionals and I couldn't induce AVNRT versus where I didn't get junctionals or even if I got junctionals, 
I was not successful in ablating AVNRT. Then go back before you ablated to see what the signal at that site with contact looks like and see if we could find differentiators. In other words, if we had the catheter here, kind of mid-CS, traditional slow pathway site, how is that different between any other site in the atrium? And what was found is almost always you'd find in sinus rhythm a signal that sort of looks like this. Uh, forget about the rest of this one, but if we focus on the atrial electrogram at this site. So since this was almost always found at these successful sites, this got an early name of slow pathway potentials. Initially, it was a good name. People liked it. They were happy with the help until one day somebody ablated at a site with the signal and got AV block, and then somebody else ablated and got AV block, and then somebody else ablated and got AV block, and then this term slow pathway potential started getting a really bad name. So how to kind of tie that together is to try to appreciate the reason why this potential in a location like here is different. It's because of the tendon of Todaro and the eustachian ridge. So from the sinus node, we very quickly can reach the myocardium behind the tendon of Todaro, like fast pathway entrance site. But to cross the eustachian ridge or skirt around the eustachian ridge, to activate the myocardium in the triangle of Koch takes longer time. So as a result, the signal becomes complex. So when we are having a catheter in the triangle of Koch, this being the tendon of Todaro, we see a signal that looks like this because the early activation here behind the tendon and then subsequent activation sharper, because that's where your catheter is, gives you this slow pathway signal. So in fact, if we have contact at a site where we ablate successfully, you will see a signal that looks like this. The problem is you will see the signal anywhere in the triangle of Koch. It doesn't tell you safe site, super safe site, or myocardium right next to the compact AV node. And that's why the utility of the slow pathway potential now is a screen. If we don't see a signal like this, it suggests you don't have contact in front of the triangle of Koch, uh, tendon of Todaro, which means you're unlikely to ablate the inferior extension right side of the slow pathway. But because you see it doesn't mean it's a good site. We still have to anatomically locate the catheter site, see with relation to the roof of the CS how far away we are from where we, the triangle is located and pick our site to ablate in that location. So it's kind of a almost necessary, but not a marker for knowing that we are at a good location to ablate. Now, maybe I'll just spend one minute to say what happens to the signal during tachycardia. So the same site if we are ablating, and if we have tachycardia, and it's typical AVNRT, we still are activating behind the tendon of Tadaro before the triangle of Koch region itself. So the quality of this signal stays the same. On the other hand, if it's atypical AVNRT with right slow pathway being early, then this sharp signal is going to come earlier because that's the tissue that's activated first. And that will be your early site that you could have found out where to ablate if you map the early location as well. If it is the left inferior extension, then we'll see neither of these patterns but it now becomes a pseudo interval to both these locations and the, you have a different interval. It's not early and it's not similar to sinus rhythm that gives you a clue that maybe I can continue to map 
and find our earlier site. So maybe we'll we'll stop there. Thanks for staying along, and uh, we'll uh, if any of if any of you have a comment, please go ahead and make it. If not, we'll add this along to uh, complete our question and answer session.